My buddy Robbie loaned me his farm, this beautiful field here, to end this video series, put a nice little bow on it. And what I want to do is basically a vehicle walk around. We're going to talk all about this one ton swap, the different things that I've done in this last week in order to make it finally functional and drivable and all that other stuff. Um, but what I want to do is do a walk around because I've this this project has been a hodgepodge of build a bumper and then work on the suspension and then and whatever. So we're just gonna go through it nose to tail. So all of you that have only seen part of these videos and ask me questions all the time about this rig, you will now know exactly what I know. We're gonna do this trail recon style and we're just gonna basically go from section to section and, uh, it, and we're just gonna cover everything that is in frame. Um, and I'm gonna have a notebook because there's so much to remember about all these little parts and pieces. And I wanna tra try to answer as many questions as possible as we go along. We're gonna start with the front and then we're gonna work our way around the vehicle all the way to the back and then we'll look under the hood. We'll finally fill up a tire with this air system and then we'll take it for a ride. So first off, the axle. This is the end of an axle series. We should talk about the axle. So we replaced the axle that I built because it didn't work out. It just wasn't the right offset and whatnot with a custom axle from Fusion 4x4. The axle is in it. Everything matches absolutely perfect because it's a custom axle. It fits in there absolutely beautifully. We have uh, zip lockers front and rear from Yukon, um, 538 gears, and we'll talk about gears here in a little bit. And let's see, what else? We've got the steering is for a kit that I got from Barnes Four Wheel Drive. It's just a do-it-yourself kit. So cut, weld, bend, all that stuff yourself. And I plan on changing the steering. I've got another build-it-yourself kit from Barnes because there's some things that I don't like about the way I did it the first time that we're gonna change um, later on. But right now I'm just driving it, making sure everything works. So the shocks are Bilstein shocks. These are the same shocks, the same style shocks, same model and everything that came on this truck whenever I bought it. And uh, I just wanted to replace it with something that was equivalent because it rode actually really well before. And so I contacted my friends at Bill Stein, told them exactly what it was, read them the part numbers and everything. And then I told them the weight changes we're gonna make and they valved them specifically for this vehicle. And to be honest with you, it rides really good. It's super soft, but it rides really, really good. The brakes are from Power Stop, and this is like a super duty Dana 60 towing brake setup. And the, the thing, it stops well, but it still feels just as mushy as it did before I put all these big heavy duty brakes and all that stuff on there. So I think that I don't have enough power from the master cylinder or the booster because it didn't stop great with the stock axles and stock brakes and it stops about the same now. And I was expecting to, for it to stop better. Um, I actually have in my shop an LR4, which is the fourth generation of the Discovery. I have an LR4 brake booster, master cylinder, um, all sitting, ready to get installed in this. So whenever I have time, I'm gonna upgrade it to the LR4 version because my mom has an LR4 and the brakes are humongous. It's got huge pistons in there. It's definitely using more fluid than what the OEM Disco 2 did. So I'm hoping that by swapping in the LR4 stuff, it's gonna make it stop a little bit more sudden. But honestly, it, it doesn't have a stopping problem. It just doesn't stop very like abruptly. If you really mash it down, it, it's real slow to stop. But if you're just driving and you're just braking and going as normal, you don't even notice uh, at all that there's a difference. It really, it feels factory in some ways. The front springs are lift springs that came with this Discovery. I don't know what the brand is or anything. It was already lifted when I got it. And then I just put spacers and whatnot underneath the lift spring where it mounts to make it to where it's the height that was gonna work for me. I, I didn't wanna go and figure out what the spring rates were and order new springs and all that. I just wanted to make work what I had. And so that's, that's the story on the front springs. This front bumper is custom made. So it was custom made by the previous owner or they paid someone to custom make it. Uh, I liked the shape of it enough that all I did was add a bull bar in the front just because I'm in a phase right now where I like this look. So I added the bull bar and then I cleaned up some of the craftsmanship because they had some really big grinder gouges and whatnot. And I have a video of that. I mean, I have a video of all this stuff um, and I'll, I'll link like a whole disco playlist in this video, but anyway. Um, I cleaned it all up, I repainted it, and that's the story on the front bumper. It is an absolute custom job. From the side of this Discovery, you can see a big, beautiful rooftop tent. Honestly, the rooftop tent, that, that this specific one really helps make this look like an overlander. It's the perfect size for the Discovery. It's the perfect shape for the Discovery. And it's, it's huge when you open it up, making it to where I can fit my whole family in there. So, I mean, I just couldn't have gotten luckier 
uh, to be working with Hulls Off-Road gear because this thing is outstanding. I built the rack from scratch. Again, there's a video. I'll, I'll put it all. It's all going to be in a, um, a video playlist. So if you want to see how I built the rack, I built the whole thing from scratch. And the rack was one of those things I knew was a little bit radical whenever I built it as far as the way it looks and the flares where I put them and all that other stuff. But I, I just kept saying in the video, you gotta wait. Once this thing's done, that rack is gonna match. It's not gonna be near as ugly when it's not on like a stockish looking um, Land Rover. And I personally am a big fan of the look. I think that it's very unique and one of a kind. This is as slim as you could possibly build for a Disco 2 because of that little bump up in the roof. And I don't know, I'm a big fan of the way it turned out. And maybe I'm partial because I built it, but there's, there's no other one like it in the world. <laughs> so I'm happy. These slides are custom and the step that was built into the slide from the previous owner um, it didn't have any center support. So the first time I took it on, we, we did like the top half of the Rubicon when we were camping and uh, I destroyed them like really quickly. So I wanted to build something that reflected my style a little bit more. And so the sliders had already been there and it was perfectly good usable material that was existing. So I didn't want to reinvent the wheel. And all I did was hack off the old bent step and built my own. And this, this isn't going anywhere unless I get like T-boned or something like that. This is a super solid step. And I know that I can lean into that step on a rock or a tree or a stump or something. And uh, it's, it's not going anywhere. That thing is solid. These gold wing windows are completely custom, of course. This is something that I built in a video. Um, I know a lot of you guys saw it because it was super popular when it came out. And so far, everything seems to be working well. I think I'm, there's some things that I want to change in the future. Right now, I don't want to change anything. Right now, I just want to do the bare minimum to get this on the trail because I'm so excited to use it. But in the future, there's some fine tuning. And one of the things I want to fine tune is some of the details about the gold wing windows. I'm not in love with the latches. And I think I want to go like one or two sizes uh, thinner in terms of the material that I used because it's just so rigid that it doesn't want to take the shape of the Discovery very well. So I think I'm going to try to use like eighth inch or something like that. Um, so far, I haven't had any like leaks or dust getting in there, but this latch, you can like see through it. So I know that on a hard rain, there's no way water wouldn't get in, um, but it's been in, it's been in my shop being worked on for a year. So it's something I haven't had to address. In the near future, it's something I'm going to have to deal with. But like I said, right now, I'm just excited to be able to use this thing. The rear corner armor is, a, it's a chunk of aluminum. I think it's just a I think it's an eighth inch, if I remember correctly. And um, yeah, there, again, it's in the video, I, I, or in the, the videos that I made on this Discovery. The rear corner armor is gonna be in the rear bumper fabrication video. So if you click on that, it was kind of a long series, but that rear bumper took a ton of work and I included things like building this rear corner armor into it. So if you wanna see how I did that, just click on that series of videos. These suspension links are from Barnes Four Wheel Drive. And these are big, heavy-duty links. The tube, the links, the bolts, all of it came from barns in a kit that you can cut and build yourself, and that's exactly what I did. So I've got uh, links for Barnes Four Wheel Drive in all of my videos, and if you use coupon code Dirt Lifestyle, you'll save some extra money. And I, I partner with these guys for tons of projects. There's a lot of stuff coming in the future that you're going to see more barn stuff because I'm a big fan of that company, and uh, I could not be happier with how heavy-duty these links are and I can't wait to get out and like really flex it out and see how everything performs off road. So since you guys have seen me work on this last time, I ordered a set of OEM Land Rover Discovery 2 airbags. And a lot of people don't know with this o 03s and 04s, you could get them with either coils in the rear or with airbags in the rear. This came with coils in the rear, at least whenever I got it. So what I did is I ordered a set of OEM airbags for the rear and I wanted to see if I could adapt that to this somehow. Ideally, I want airbags that are going to work in conjunction with coils because then if the airbags ever fail, the coil will still suspend the weight of the vehicle and get you out of there. But I want to have the assistance of airbags because if I put a bunch of weight back here, which we will, there's going to be people and food and water and all that stuff adds up. I want to be able to level this thing out and make it to where it's not just sagging down in the rear. Also, if I can control those airbags independently, then it'll make it to where I can lean when I'm on the trail. So if the trail starts to get really leany, and this thing is top heavy, look how tall it is, I can put a little bit more air in one bag, a little bit less in the other, and I can lean it around those obstacles, make it a little bit safer, and I can level out this rooftop tent as soon as we get to camp, just with a push of a button. So 
There's a lot of reasons that I wanted to use these airbags. And these airbags, I have never seen this configuration. I talked to some other Land Rover people and they haven't either. Um, what I did is I put the OEM airbag inside of this lift coil. This lift coil came with the Discovery. I don't know what brand it is or anything else, but it fits in there perfect. And so it makes it to where we can use both in conjunction. I didn't like the amount of travel I was getting out of the Firestone airbags that I had in there before. Those are basically just made to like stiffen a little bit and help you support a little bit extra weight, but they only went to 35 PSI and supposedly these are rated all up to like 105 and they're made to have travel, giving me a lot more ability to flex around that obstacle like we were just talking about. So I'll, at the end, you guys are gonna see, it's really cool. The airbag thing is super, super dope. And uh, once we do this little walk around, we'll fire up the air system, we'll turn on the airbags, and you'll see how much travel we have. Now we're moving our way to the back of the Land Rover, and obviously the first thing that sticks out is this crazy tire carrier. I am so proud of the way this turned out. This was a ton of work, and if you watch the series on it, I had to make it a series because building a bumper tire carrier that's this complex, that has this many moving parts and things working together, it just takes a lot of hours to figure out. And... Uh, I didn't have any templates to go off of. I just started taking measurements and sticking steel together. Um, and if something wasn't right, I would trim it or cut it and move it. And it was just, it was a trial and error process, but this is what we're left with. And we've got a fully functional overland tailgate bumper tire carrier thing. And it's, it's honestly kind of the crown jewel of the Land Rover. I mean, if, I don't know, there's a lot of things that are the crown jewel of the Land Rover, but this is one of my favorites for sure because of how functional it's gonna be when we're camping. Because now we have tabletop surface all over the place. And uh, a lot of people, when I first started, were telling me that this is the wrong way to do it because if you open up your spare, it'll open up into traffic. And they're not wrong. Um, but from the beginning, what I, what I saw when I opened up this big door, when I bought the Land Rover, I was like, man, I wanna have some sort of tabletop surface that drops down uh, off the door. And as you can see, we've got tabletop surface that drops down. This is just a work surface. And then this, I drop my, uh, my stove into. But I, I saw, I wanted tabletop surface over there and I wanted it over here. And I didn't wanna have to like carry a whole nother like table. I just wanted to figure out a way to mount it to the carrier. And so from the get go, I wanted to mount the carrier on the driver's side and I can just open it part way and get into the back if I need to. But like if I need to change a tire or something like that, all my tools for that are in the gold wing window on the passenger side and then the spare tires on the very back. So I don't have to open this up into traffic unless I just need to get a beverage or get to some uh, camping gear. And if I'm getting to camping gear, it's probably not gonna be on an interstate. <laughs> so believe it or not, this is actually a pretty practical setup. I, at least I think it is. And um, yeah, that's it. I'm, I'm really proud of the way that turned out. Let me see what, uh, this is why I wrote all this stuff down because I'm gonna be forgetting about all the little details that I need to touch touch on here. Uh, backup lights are from Baja Designs. I still need to, I still need to tie those in. Um, I've got all the harness and everything at home. It's just one of those things that's on this crazy to-do list that I have to finish up. We've got Baja Designs chase lights up here and they're amber chase lights. They're, that's supposed to help cut through dust a little bit better, the amber color. And um, I wanted to have chase lights so when people are following me, they don't rear end me. Because sometimes when you're on those dirt roads and it just starts blowing dust everywhere, it's really hard to see the guy in front of you or behind you. So I have chase lights in the back and I've got some lights that illuminate in the front. Uh, they're like my daytime running lights um, that are in the Baja Designs. It's the, those Baja Designs LP6s are backlit. And so that's all tied into this like chase light system. This organizer is something that, of course, we built custom. I mean, you're gonna, there's a theme here. <laughs> I built a lot of this custom. And this is uh, out of MDF, the pros. It is ultra silent. There is no squeaks. You can't hear, you can barely hear exhaust notes through the cab because this is insulated so well with this carpet. Um, and it's organized really well to where it really compartmentalizes things to where there's the gold wing windows that open up and they're their own little space. There's a net and space that's behind the passenger seat so you could put pillows or blankets or whatever for the kiddos. And then there's all this drawer system and my fridge. Um, but the cons are that it's super heavy. It's just, it's MDF. MDF is not light. And you can feel all the weight that I added to this Discovery when you drive it down the road. And we'll get there when we go and drive this thing. The fridge is an ARB Zero fridge. 
and it's on a slide that I built. And if you look at the, uh, the series, if you watch the series where I built this whole setup, you'll see me build the slide and everything too. And I built it literally to the exact dimensions of this fridge. I built this whole thing around this fridge because I didn't want to have any wasted space back here. The rear axle is a Sterling 10 and a half that's out of a like 99 Super Duty or a 2000 Super Duty, somewhere in that range. And uh, I've got 538 gears, zip lockers, just like the front, um, stock shafts, and what else, what else is, should we note about the rear axle? I guess that's it as far as internals go. Um, and it is, it, it connects to the drivetrain with some Adams drive shaft, drive shafts. And these drive shafts are nuts because the offset of the, uh, the rear axle is not the same as the offset of the transfer case, but luckily it doesn't actually vibrate hardly at all. It, it actually, they were, they did a good job making these drive shafts. So we did a CV shaft or CV joint on the back, which is on, so where it mounts to the rear axle and we have it on the front, which is where it mounts to the transfer case. And we did the same thing in the front to make it to where even though all of these parts aren't made to work together and they're at kind of at goofy angles and offsets and whatnot, it kind of polishes out those blemishes and makes it to where it's still a usable and functional rig. So, I mean, Adam's really knocked out of the park with these shafts. They are bizarre and it's a whole bunch of parts and pieces that shouldn't go together and they work because they made it work. Um, the rear brakes are power stop brakes, just like the front. Um, they're huge, they're heavy duty. Uh, I, I just, I can't say enough about how awesome it is to have big brakes on this thing. Knowing that I'm gonna be coming down really steep grades for long periods of time, these should have no problem cooling because they're made for a really big heavy duty truck. And even though this is heavy, it's not like a super duty hauling a big load heavy. So anyway, I like oversized brakes. To me, that is an important part of this entire thing. The last mod that I need to do back here is a sway bar. I'm still trying to figure that out. I've got a bunch of random sway bars from projects in the past that are in the shop, and I'm gonna try and retrofit one to the rear of this Land Rover. If that's something you're interested in seeing, let me know, because I was considering just bolting on a sway bar or mounting a sway bar to this and not making a video on it, just because I don't know how many people are really interested. But if you are interested, then put that below, because. Like I've got a TJ sway bar. I've got a bunch of random sway bars that I think I could, that would match with this project. And if that's something you're interested in seeing, just let me know. Before we move to the engine bay, I do want to talk about the interior a little bit. The interior in this for having 200,000 miles looks great. They did a really good job building these interiors for long-term use. Because like when you look at my Mini Cooper, I mean, you pull a handle and it falls off. There's so much stuff that's just falling apart in that. It's got like 140,000 miles. It's a 2006. This is an 03 with 200,000, and the seats look outstanding, front and back. Things are a little dirty in here, but other than that, the dash isn't cracked up. There isn't anything really falling apart or even making a lot of noise going down the road, and I'm, I'm very pleased with just how well this vehicle has held up in that regard. It's got two sunroofs. I'm just using the front because the, the, uh, the roof rack is so low, I can't use the rear sunroof, which is fine, um, yeah. That's, it's worth it to have a rooftop tent in my opinion. Um, and then we are going to upgrade this stereo to a unit that I've got at home. I just haven't installed it yet for a unit that has front and rear cameras because that is gonna be huge in this rig. I can't see out of the back window and it's got tiny little side mirrors. So having reverse cameras, awesome. And then whenever you're making steep climbs, it's nice to have that front camera. So we're gonna do dual cameras. I wanna set it up with really good navigation. I wanna use my Onyx software on there. Hopefully we can make that work. And anyway, so that'll be a future video. Um, for our, uh, our switches and stuff, I've got this uh, switch panel from ProComp over here. And this switch panel has our front, front locker, rear locker. Um, all this stuff was hooked up and installed in the electrical portion of this video series. So you can watch that entire electrical install if that's something that you're curious about. And then we have this switch panel from Ride Tech. And this switch panel has a gauge, it has gauges in the middle because this controls the rear airbags at will. So we can pump one up as we're driving down the road or both up or release all the air out. However we wanna do it, we can do that right here through this switch panel. The last thing we talk about is a tablet. Don't know if I'm gonna keep the tablet. I built this tablet setup for like less than 200 bucks. That's Onyx software, an inexpensive tablet with a heavy duty case. And um, I uh, got that mount and everything, bolted it all in. And it, it works great, but if I get this nice big screen that is on this radio and I can get it to work with uh, the navigation stuff, then I'll probably get rid of the tablet, but 
We'll see. In the immediate, in the immediate future, until I install that radio, I'm going to just keep using this tablet. And uh, you know what? I'll put the tablet, all this tablet information for those of you that are looking for a good way to have like off-road nav navigation. I'll put all this stuff, including the mount, in like an Amazon shopping cart. Now that we're under the hood, this is a perfect time to talk about today's sponsor, and that is Techron. Techron makes some killer additives, and this is one that I use in all my high mileage vehicles. It just says it right there, high mileage. And today, specifically, I want to talk about dilution, because this is something a lot of people don't think about. I see people ask questions online, like in Facebook groups and whatnot, like if you use too much of an additive, can it hurt your engine or hurt your fuel system or anything like that? And the short answer is no. You could theoretically, if you have such a high detergent and your system is so dirty, you could maybe plug a filter or something like that. Um, but the main issue you could run into if you use too much of a product would be uh, dilution. And that is if, I think that's the right way to say that word. The root word is dilute. If you dilute your fuel system too much, it's gonna make it to where a product like this isn't, isn't giving you a negative effect in the, your engine's performance. However, the lowered octane rating of your fuel because it's being diluted will impact your engine's performance. So I hope that makes sense. What's gonna happen is if you buy 89 octane, you put five bottles of these in here, whereas they recommend one, you're diluting your fuel. And so you're gonna make it to where that 89 octane rating starts to drop your knock sensor is gonna sense knock because the octane is lower. It's now gonna pull timing. You're gonna reduce your engine performance. You're gonna reduce your, uh, your fuel economy and whatnot. And all you gotta do, just read the back. These always tell you exactly how much they need. These products are great. I've been using them for a while and this is exactly what I use in this vehicle right here. The sun's starting to come out. So if you see me all squinty and stuff, I apologize. <laughs> We're outdoors so and the wind's starting to pick up a little bit. Anyway, under the hood, We've got two compressors. I think it's crazy that people mount compressors inside the cab. I mean, if I've got the kiddos and the wife and whatnot in there um, and they're waiting for me to air up, I don't want them to have to just like listen to these super loud compressors in the cab. So I like the idea of putting them under the hood. Um, yeah, so that's why I put them underneath the hood. We've got two compressors here, both from Smitty Built. We've got one right here, the other one's underneath this other bracket. And these are Smitty Built 2781s. These are really fast by themselves, but I think that when we combine the two of them, it's gonna fill a tire pretty quickly. So today, as long as I remembered tire deflators, we will fill a tire just to see how fast it fills. Anyway, the tank is custom. I mounted it kind of like underneath, um, underneath our winch and I made it kind of like a manifold and a tank. It's not super big, but it's got kind of a buffer between these things having to turn off and on anytime I need to use air. I don't want it to go from the compressor to the airbag. I want it to go from the compressor to an air tank so there's a little bit of a built-in buffer between when I push the switch and when it needs to fire up that compressor again to help fill those bags. For those of you that watched the series where we built this air system, you saw us build a custom manifold to supply air to our lockers and to the rear airbags. Um, and yeah, we built a bunch of custom stuff in that system. Uh, it's all tucked away. Everything's routed as cleanly as we possibly can. We do kind of have wires and tubes going everywhere, but this is the best that I could do under the circumstances. I recently added a bigger aluminum radiator. I wanted to, this supposedly these have huge issues with overheating. It's not something I've experienced yet, but it's not something I want to experience at all. So I put a big heavy duty aluminum radiator in here. Um, I flushed the entire system. I just want to keep this cooling system as healthy as possible. I also replaced every single hose in the system to make sure that it doesn't burst on us when we're on the trail. And then I overheat and, and cook something. So uh, then we've got a uh, custom intake. And I did this because I, I wanted to fit two batteries in here. This did not come stock with two batteries. I had to move a ton of stuff around, including the intake. And uh, so I had to build this custom intake. This is just enough to get us by until I have time to design something better. I want to build a box and then I want to do a snorkel, but we're just not there yet. So for now, we just got one of these cheesy filters with a pre-filter on it. And um, hopefully it hopefully it filters enough to get us by until I have time to build a real air box for this thing. For the electrical system, I wanted to use Optima because I have had outstanding luck with Optimas. I have an Optima in my house or in my shop that I bought when I was 19 and it still holds a charge. I still bench test stuff with it all the time. And so I've stuck with Optima on all my vehicles. I use blue tops because I like the extra terminals. This is like a marine style starting battery and the extra terminals make it to where it's super easy to add accessories and not have all your accessories just come off of like one thing. 
The reason I didn't go bigger than this, because when I talked to Optima, they recommended that I go with a larger battery, is because of height. This is as small as I could get it because of where the wheel wells are located and because of where the rest of the stuff is located. And so I couldn't, I mean, I can't go a, a half an inch higher. This is as close to the hood as I'm comfortable with. Um, and so it's just that simple. They're not huge deep cycle batteries, but they are deep cycle enough that this, like this is the battery that's gonna like basically be the house battery. Um, it's good enough that it should be able to run my fridge all night, no problem, and those are gonna be my requirements for it. So anyway, that's the whole reason that I decided to go with a little bit smaller battery here. Our coolant reservoir is all aluminum. This is something we built in-house, and so far it seems to be holding fluids where they need to go. This used to be plastic. I didn't wanna to have to deal with the reliability of plastic splitting because um, it was old plastic and plastics get old. They love to split at random times. And so we got ahead of that problem by building one out of aluminum. With the power steering reservoir, I wanted to do it for the same reasons, but I also had to relocate it off the fender because we put a battery, a compressor, and an intake there. So we had to relocate it onto the engine. That's where the ACE pump used to be. I built this to mount into the ACE pump mounts. Um, and, and I built it bigger, so it holds a little bit more fluid, which is always great. And uh, so far, it seems to be working just fine. The last thing we want is for the plastic reservoir to split. We don't have power steering, and we can't turn these meaty 37s, which actually reminds me that we forgot to talk about the wheels and tires. The wheels are from Mamba, Mamba Off-Road. I'll put links to the wheels and tires um, in this video description. I think it's like an M19, I believe, is the style. It's 8 on 170, which is the Super Duty bolt pattern. And uh, the tire is a 37-1250 R18. I had a lot of, I shouldn't say a lot. I had some pushback when I got these wheels and tires of people saying that um, they just, they didn't, I don't think they saw what I saw. I think that a Land Rover needs a slightly bigger wheel. It looks better with a bigger wheel. And I thought that the 17 on a 32 looked good before. So now that I went to the 37, I decided to go with an 18. And I think that they look spectacular. This, these are BFG KM3s. This is one of my favorite um, tires that I've used so far. And you will see me do a complete review on these tires in the future because I have them on a few different rigs now and uh, they've been awesome. So now I want to start this thing. We're going to fire up the compressors and uh, we will play around with the airbags. And if I can find something to deflate the tire, we'll deflate it, inflate it, and then we'll go for a drive. <laughs> A couple questions I know I'm gonna get. One is gonna be exhaust. The exhaust sounds awesome on this now, and people are gonna wanna know what I did. So I did modify the exhaust in order to fit the new suspension and everything. You will never see an exhaust modification video on this channel because the uh, EPA is, they're serious now. <laughs> they're, not, they're not letting anybody get away with anything, so I'm not gonna have a video of me touching exhaust. But the uh, muffler, I cut out the muffler that was on here, which was really quiet, which is fine. Um, but I wanted something that flowed and had a little bit of tone to it. And I had this muffler, no brand, no name muffler in the back of my shop that I cut off of another vehicle I built. I don't even know, it just looks kind of like a Flowmaster or actually no, it looks more like a Borla. And so I slapped that on and this thing sounds great in my opinion. It's got a really good tone, it's not too loud. Um, it, you can tell it's a V8 now, which, which I really like and appreciate. Other questions I'm going to get. The uh, steering. The steering is great. It's got such a small scrub radius from these wheels and tires because the, the wheels that I bought, I didn't cut these, these Ford, or sorry, these full size Super Duty axles down um, at all. They're still full width, same width that you would get on a Super Duty but I did get wheels that brought the tires and wheels way, way in to where it's got a great scrub radius. So you can turn it effortlessly, literally with a pinky as I'm turning right now, um, and it feels perfect. I just need to tweak some different things on the pitman arm. So I think I'm gonna change, I'm gonna cut and change some stuff on the pitman arm, cut and change some stuff on the steering linkage, and um, hopefully that'll fix what I'm feeling in the wheel. I don't feel any bump steer or anything like that, but. It turns more one way than it does the other, so I just need to make some small changes. Oh, excuse me. Um, other stuff. 
brakes, the brakes, I mean, it stops good, good enough, you know? It's, again, it's just kind of mushy feeling like it was before, so I'm gonna replace the master cylinder and brake booster and go from there. Listen to that. It sounds awesome. Now, some other questions. I guess I'm gonna have to roll up these windows so we can still talk. I know there's a bunch of people who are gonna be asking about gearing, and I did 538 gears in here, which a bunch of people said was gonna be too low. Um, but when I did all the math on paper, it looked perfect. Uh, I want it to rev higher than it did factory because I want to make sure I can retain as much factory um, like torque and whatnot as possible. And gearing it a little bit lower than you need is kind of a nice way to counteract all the extra weight you add onto a vehicle like this because we added a ton of weight, um, which we will weigh this in a future video. But anyway, I geared it too low because I didn't calculate the fact that these transfer cases are kind of like the old school gear driven transfer cases where in a lot of a lot of situations it gears down your high range too it doesn't just gear down your low range meaning that whenever I calculated my RPM on at the, on the highway I didn't do the extra reduction that I should have that's in the transfer case because modern transfer cases are not that way at all this is probably one of the last ones that you're going to find like that so anywho um, it screams a little bit at uh, freeway speeds, but it's not too bad. And the transfer, the transmission is actually doing a really good job at learning the new gears. When I first drove it out of the driveway, it was like just con it didn't even want to start in first <laughs> because it's geared so low. Um, but as I've been driving it, it is learning really well actually, and getting really close to where I would want to shift it anyway. I think I've got it. Yeah, I've got it in sport. And uh, that really helps it just kind of rev a little bit higher before it hits the next gear. And also not just start out in second all the time. I want it to start out first. But here we are. We're probably going, I don't know, 50 or so. And it's not bad. I got a little bit of noise from like tires. Or maybe that's, I think that's tires. I don't know. A little bit of a road line, but it's nothing crazy. It's completely manageable. Um, also, people have asked me about the roof rack. I have never addressed this. Um, the roof rack's not that noisy. Uh, I can see why people would think it could be, but it's really not that bad. I don't really notice it up there. I mean, you're, there's so many other sounds coming out of this thing. <laughs> so, uh, and now I, I hear the exhaust more than anything, really. Do I have lights? That's gonna be one that people are gonna ask. I do have lights now. My first drive around the block, no lights. Um, it seemed like that I wasn't tripping the ABS system. Uh, because if you remember, whenever I did this one-ton swap, I did a lot. I put a lot of work into making these sensors work, and it looked like they did initially. But now I've got a light or got a code. So what I need to do is I need to hook up a scan tool and see what corner I'm having an issue, and then I can troubleshoot from there. Hopefully, it's as simple as like a bad sensor, um, or maybe a chunk of metal stuck in this. Who knows? Who knows? Until I until I can scan it. Um, now. As far as you guys getting to see me drive this a whole bunch, we're not really gonna get a lot, of, a big chance to do that in this video. I, I need to, I really need to continue to work on it before I drive it much more. So I'm headed home right now. I'm headed to the shop to put some some hours in and get this discovery ready because I've got a big trip coming up here in a couple weeks to Montana. So those of you who are Patreon supporters already know we're doing a uh, Patreon, um, we're doing a Patreon fan ride in Montana. We're all gonna go camping together. We're gonna go through a couple of ghost towns together. It should be a, a real fun time. So I think I'm gonna do a video of that whole experience and that'll be like our first real test run in this Land Rover, in this Land Rover. So that is when you're gonna see me use this off road for the first time. Until then, I'm just gonna slowly tweak. This is a brand new build. I just got it driving yesterday. So I'm just gonna slowly tweak everything, get it reliable, retorque all the bolts, just all the stuff you have to do whenever you've done this much work on a project. And then slowly but surely and incrementally, we're gonna take it out and we're gonna push it to its limits. So I think that'll be the end of this one. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed it, push the thumbs up. Um, if you wanna see any of this build, if you're brand new to the channel and you're a discovery owner, um, I've got a lot of it documented. So go through, hit the playlist, and you'll see every detail and you'll be able to answer pretty much any question that you may have. Uh, if you want to help support the channel, you go to thunderlifestyle.com. T-shirts, hats, neck gaiters, stickers, all that stuff. Uh, if 
We also have a link to our Patreon account, and we're doing way more with Patreon supporters now. So if uh, you want to get involved in one of these fan rides or anything like that, make sure you go over to our Patreon. That's where we're going to start launching all that stuff. So um, anyway, I hope to see you guys on some of these future fan rides that we're doing through Patreon. We all came to a sudden stop in the country. Please don't hit me. No one hit me. All right. <laughs> it's a good day. Um, yeah, I think that's about it, folks. So anyway, if you want to follow me on social media, I'm at Nerd Lifestyle Nate. We'll see you next time.